Well, from <coughs> what I can hear, y'all got some full stomachs. Uh, the, the volume has gone down. It's usually is relation to in relation to the stomach contents going up. So uh, I'm glad y'all were able to get a, a pile to eat. We got a few things left. As soon as we're done, uh, we encourage y'all to take it home. We don't want we don't want to have to take it. I mean, it's y'all's anyway. So get you a plate, take you some home for lunch. Uh, looks like we've got a little bit of a few things left, so take that home with you when you go. Uh, Richard, when is our next meeting? The 11th. Of April. So if you don't know Richard, Richard uh, Rich is my son, and he is our resident calendar. He will tell you exactly when and where we are doing everything. So uh, next month on the 11th will be our next Shop Church meeting. And, uh, and, and, and we are confident in the Lord that everything's going to keep going in the way that it needs to go, and we'll see you all next month for that. Uh, but tonight, uh, before we leave, I'd like to invite uh, Dennis Crahan to come up. Uh, Dennis has spoken for us before. A lot of you guys have heard Dennis before. Uh, he's a Christ, he, 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 he attended Christ, Christ Church. Church. Yeah. You were preaching at Poplar Chapel in their okay. interim. In <coughs> where are you? Are you preaching anywhere now? Just wherever somebody needs you. Wherever somebody there. needs you. So yeah. there you go. He's he's a he's a he's got a Bible for high. So uh, <laughs> uh, if you if you know him. Anything, please talk to Dennis tonight. Uh, Dennis, uh, I've heard him preach before. Uh, I relate to his uh, testimony, and I love to hear the man preach. And so we're glad to have Dennis preach for us tonight. So, Dennis, take it away, buddy. Uh, good to be with you all again. If it asks you to do something for me, okay? <laughs> One, three. I want you to say, that man ain't right. <laughs> One, two, three. That that man is right. No, no, you're right. I'm not right. <laughs> We're talking about love. All these men. I'm not going to sing any Barry White songs either. I'm not right. <laughs> You'll never find. <laughs> I'm not right because you know what today is? This is my anniversary. I didn't have the heart. When Kurt called me in January, was it? January, January, I was having just a little kind of embarrassing medical issue with a cyst. And I didn't know if I was going to have to have surgery. So I told him I couldn't come in January. Maybe we could schedule it sometime down the road. And uh, he said, well, how about March? And I said, sure, March would be fine. I said, well, what date is that? And he said, the 14th. And that was my anniversary. And I didn't have the heart to tell him. I mean, look, look at his face, would you? Would you have the heart to turn him down? <laughs> I didn't have the heart to turn him down. But me and my wife have been married 42 years. Wow. And after 42 years... And I, and I always loved Debbie, but I really didn't know how to love Debbie. Because for a lot of those years, I wasn't in Christ. So we lived together. We had a good relationship. We cared for each other. But I didn't know how God expected me to love her. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. So we had such a great relationship. I said, Deb... On the anniversary, I can't take you out to dinner. She said, all right, that'll be fine. We'll just go one other day. So, but we did get dressed up, and we went out this afternoon. I took her to a funeral in Elizabeth City. <laughs> so don't you tell me I'm not romantic. <laughs> oh, my gosh, that's hilarious. But I'm probably going to piss you off tonight, some of you, because I'm going to tell you what God expects of you as a man and a husband. And that's not an easy thing to talk about in front of a group of men, especially nowadays. But if you would do these things, you'd be a man God be proud of. And your wife would be so blessed. Because we're talking about love. And for love to really work, you've got to do it God's way. Because any other way of love is worldly. It's of, it's of the world. So it's flawed. It's imperfect. 
But you've got to get the God thing right first. And in Matthew 22, the great commandment, you know, Pharisee comes up to Jesus and is trying to trick him. So well, what's the, the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, well, you've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. I mean, that's an all-compelling love. That's not a drift in that church every now and then love. That's not an Easter Sunday, Christmas, uh, Eve kind of love. That's a God first in everything kind of love. And it's a love, it's an L1 love. There's a L and a 1. And then there's an L2 love. But he says, once you get that right, once your soul is going to be connected to God properly in worship, you will love him with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then he said, just do what comes naturally once you get that right. You just love everyone else as your neighbor. And you love because you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You've been redeemed by God giving you a second chance at life. Not just life in a cursed and fallen world, but life that's truly life. Life in the Lord, life in the church, life in God, loving him the way he should be loved. And then you learn to love as God loved. So that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight is the priority of love. Because really passion, when you boil it down, is driven by and it's sustained by God's love. If you want to just note passion, and I'm just not talking about a Hallmark kind of passion. Think about passion, the way somebody can be consumed by it. Think of the president of Ukraine, Zelensky. The way he stood up to Russia. The way he's standing up because he loves his country and he loves his people. That's a passionate kind of love that really comes deep from the deep inside out. God wants us to love him with that kind of passion because he's worthy of that kind of love. He is God, and we're his creation. So he also talks to us, once we get the God part of love right, then that love is going to spill over into every other aspect of our life. And he's going to command you, he's going to challenge you, He's going to expect of you to love your wife as Jesus loved the church. I don't know where your relationship is. You might, and I'm so sick. I've been a preacher at Jarvisburg for 25 years. And I saw marriage upon marriage, even in the church, break up. Where I'm worshiping now, three or four young couples are breaking up and they attend church. If they had a husband that loved their wife as Jesus loved the church, that marriage would never have failed. So God's going to hold you, he's going to hold me accountable for the way we love the person that God has brought into our lives. And he outlines that in, in uh, Ephesians Chapter 5. Wives, and this is the part you'll like, wives submit to your husband as to the Lord. For the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body in which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Oh man, <laughs> we love that. Your Bible says you're supposed to submit to me. Uh-uh. Love He's, he's assuming in this text, because he's been talking about the love of God and the, and the love for God in the church through the whole book. And he's assuming that as a man who's in the church and as a man who is in Ephesus or a man who's living in Beargrass, that if you're in covenant with Christ, you will love your wife as Jesus love the church. And if you love her like that, the natural flow of her love back to you will be awesome. It'll be genuine. It's bathed in love. It's bathed in agape love 
of God. No strings attached. You love her because God brought her into your life. And it's your responsibility to love her and care for her. And then he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing <clears throat> with water through the word and to present to her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. That's an all-encompassing kind of love. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and he cares for it. Amen. We just fit. We just did. You just, we just, you just put on the show. You fed and cared for yourself. <laughs> After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does in church. For we are members of his body for this reason. And he's quoting this from Genesis chapter 2, back in the beginning of, of, of mankind. It says, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and as the wife must respect her husband. You do your job and love her the way God expects you to love her, the reciprocal nature of that will be her love and affection and devotion for you. And that's what God intended. He intended the family, he intended the Christian man to marry a Christian woman that they would raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord so that they would propagate the faith throughout all the earth. And I went to Melvin Stein's funeral today as a professor at a... a grown up Bible college for many years. He's also uh, was our professor when we were in school, a counseling professor. But my, my daughter married into the Steins family. And I remember talking to, to Harris when he was coming to ask uh, my daughter's hand in marriage. And I, I, was giving him, I was giving him a time when he came. <laughs> and I was telling him he needed to love her the way God loves her, you need to love her the way I loved her, and that they needed to leave and continue the legacy of faith that has come from the Steins family and from the Crehan family, that we live in this world not just to make a living, not just to be in the world. We are faith people who believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and everything in our life revolves around the one idea that God is Lord. Amen. Amen. And that if we follow his precepts, our life will be the best possible life that we can live in a cursed and fallen world, living wrapped in this flesh that craves to do sinful things 24-7. So what do I want you to do? I want you to go home and love your wife like you've never loved her before. Because God expects you to do that. I don't want your children to have to go through a divorce and watch their mother and father separate. It does devastation to the children. I want you to have a fulfilled life in Christ living harmoniously with the one you've chosen and the one most of you stood before a preacher and made vows to God to never to leave and to treat her in sickness and health and all those things so death do you part. So I just ask you to focus your life with your wife by you being humble. Philippians 2 talks about Jesus leaving the glories of heaven to come to earth, to live and to teach like no other, to die on the cross that we could be reconciled 
back to God. He left the glories. He humbled himself, leaving the glories of heaven to come accomplish his mission on earth. And that's what God expects us to do as, as men. Humble ourselves and to lift in our humility, to lift our wives up and make her feel like a queen. Make her feel like a queen. Not just cohabitate. You lift her up as you humble yourself, as Jesus humbled himself. Make her, you, you intentionally put her above you. Now you go home and do that tonight, you might get hit with something. Because she's going to think you're on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to you? Who you been hanging with? <laughs> that stupid guy they brought down from, from Greenville. <laughs> you want a great life? Humble yourself. You want a great marriage? You humble yourself and lift her up. Then, just focus on a passionate life together. Now, passion wanes over time, but it should never leave. You know, passion when you're young is all about the physical passion. And the, and the fleshly pleasures that God puts between a man and a wife to enjoy, that brings forth children to perpetuate the faith. But as time goes on, those kind of exact passions, they wane some, and it becomes more of an emotional passion that you just love being together, you love doing things together. And then just have fun. The Bible says in this sense, he says you're to leave, cleave, and weave your life together. You leave your mother and father, and you cleave unto each other. Man, it's you two against the world. You made a promise to God to love and care for each other. And then in that beautiful harmony that God places only in marriage, then you weave a perfect life together. And you become, as the Bible says, you become one flesh. I mean, you start, <laughs> you know what the other's going to say before they say it. You know, you just shared so much of your life that you just know each other from the inside out. And then finally, just have fun. Enjoy this life that is a mist. And it's a vapor, James says. Enjoy your life together. Don't take her for granted. Enjoy the life that you share together. Ecclesiastes 9.9 9 says, Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of the meaningless life we live here and have fun. See, Solomon, the smartest man in all the world in the Old Testament, looked at life and he saw it's futile, it's just futile if God's not involved in it. He says, but when God's involved in it, it has purpose and meaning. And I just want to be here tonight to challenge you on my anniversary to love your life. Don't do as I do. <laughs> we have such a strong relationship. Remember L1? Love God first. When I told Debbie, I couldn't break this pretty, pretty face's heart, you know, I said, she said, you go do the work of the Lord. Do what God's called you to do. Go be with those men. We'll have dinner this week. So don't be calling me on Thursday. We're going to dinner on Thursday. By the way. <laughs> I know some women live with difficult relationships because of their husbands. And I know some of you maybe live with a hard-hearted woman. But it's your job. God's going to hold you accountable for that marriage and that relationship. Be the best man of God you can be. And she'll love you and cherish you, and you'll have a great relationship. Don't live in this life for mediocrity. Live the best life you can in the Lord. God bless Amen. You. <clears throat> I never have to worry about 
come back. <laughs> I, I know there's some folks out here that ain't married, but you just heard how to do it right. And, and there are some folks here that are married, and you just heard how to do it right. And you're right. If you go home and you do what Dennis just said, you're liable to get hit with something. <laughs> But it may not be bad either. <laughs> Dennis may be getting some thank you notes and Christmas cards. So, <laughs> love your wife the way God intends you to love your wife. You are men. Not the world standard of men. You are godly men. And this world is to be shared with that woman that is in your life. Man, my... I've been on both sides of Dennis, and that's one of the things that I love about Dennis. Dennis ain't always been a Christian. And the guys at the fire department, what do you say? <coughs> he ain't always been a preacher. <laughs> I've been on both sides of it. And I can tell you 100%, I have a lot more fun on this side of life Amen. than I did on the outside of Amen. Jesus. Amen. Love your wife, and she'll love you back. Love her the way that God tells you. And, and, and I will say this, every now and then, it's rare. You may not have a wife that loves you back, but you do the right thing always regardless Amen. because you will be held accountable Amen. for it. I love y'all. Thank you for being here. We got leftovers. Take them home. We had some good food for thought from God's word. Take it home. Put it into practice. <clears throat> Dear Holy Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for being better to us than we deserve. Thank you, Father, for putting people in our lives that, that mean so much to us, that we love uh, running the race together, that we love sharing life together. And Lord, I thank you for evenings like this, that we can enjoy one another's company, but we can also be challenged by your holy word. Father, thank you for Dennis. Thank you for the message you put on his heart. Thank you for the folks that are here. Lord, I pray that it doesn't fall on deaf ears, that people hear it and not only hear it, but put it into practice in their life, that your kingdom would be glorified. Father, help us to be walking billboards for the grace and mercy and love that you pour into our lives every day. Father, we love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. April 11th, come back.